Today I will talk about yeah, a bunch of different approaches, namely integer programming, constraint programming, as well as hybrid decomposition approaches to this DDGP class of problems. And this is a joint work with my former master's student, Moira McNeil, who is currently a PhD student of mine. And my lab, as you can see on the left corner, computational optimization lab, uh, we are mostly dealing with uh, uh, computational problems. So in this work as well, we will try to solve a particular DDGP, more specifically, as Douglas mentioned, like an optimal vertex ordering problem, computationally more efficiently. So after quickly introducing a few basic concepts and the formal definition, problem definition, and more importantly, it is motivation, I will present our alternative mathematical formulations as well as our decomposition algorithms. By the way, I put the chat on the other screen. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the chat, but in case I may not be able to follow them in real life, in real time, please like, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me at any point. All right, so let's get started. So I'm gonna start with the, again, just for completeness, for the sake of completeness with the DGP definition. All right, so what is distance geometry? Distance geometry is the study of problems where we would like to determine positions for a set of points in geometric space while preserving some known distances between these points. So the problem, as Douglas also mentioned, the problem can be represented on a graph, not necessarily complete, although here on the left, I do have a complete graph example, where the vertices of the graph are the points that we would like to find the position in the geometric space, and the edges are weighted, and their weights are actually representing the known distances between these pairs of points, right? So in addition to such a graph, we also are going to talk about this input number k, which denotes the dimension of the geometric space. So what type of coordinates, how many uh, elements these coordinates that we are trying to find for our points should have in the geometric space. So in this example, I'm working with k equal to 2. So for these given four points, v0 up to v4. And by the way, moving forward, I will start the indices by 0, not 1. So in this example, I have four points. So I'm looking for four corners in two-dimensional Euclidean space. And if we can do that, as in the right figure, if we can find such a set of coordinates for our points, then we call such a solution a realization or rather an embedding of our input graph D. So in that case, I just would like to mention one thing is that the coordinates that we are talking about, they could very well have some fractional or even positive negative, but especially fractional components as well. And in this example, V3 here. So DGP has a wide range of applications, maybe the most common one being in molecular geometry. And we've seen actually some of those applications in this very mini symposium. So I'm not going to provide any motivation, further motivation, I think, necessary for applications of DGP. So as I mentioned, in a realization of the input graph, some coordinates can indeed be fractional. So in other words, like naturally, the positions that we are working with, they are defined in a continuous space. Right? So if our input graph is indeed complete, then we can find a solution, a realization in other words, by, as Douglas very well nicely explained, by solving a system of quadratic equations. And in this case, actually, it becomes a system of linear equations. However, in many of the applications, we don't have a complete graph. In other words, like the distances between some pairs of vertices, they are not available to us. And as such, this procedure wouldn't apply. So in such a case, what we can do is, if it is complete, it's great. Otherwise, what we can do is, if we would like to, and as a combinatorial optimization person, if we would like to, let's say, make use of combinatorial methods to solve the DGP, we should establish some conditions under which the solution space of the DGP can be discretized, right? And one way to accomplish this is to find the linear order of our vertices of the graph with certain properties. So if we would like to, in other words, like find such an order, if we find one, then the solution space of DGP can be discretized. As such, it will become finite, which will make our job much, much easier. All right, so one such order is this so-called DVOP order, distance vertex ordering problem I will introduce next. So in this case, what are our inputs? So first of all, we are given this number k, the dimension of our geometric space, and we do have our input graph g. And what we are looking for is this type of an ordering or an order of our vertices with certain properties, right? So in that regard, our first property is that the first of these 
k in my example here, k is equal to two. So what I would like in my order of the vertices is the ones that I placed in the first k plus one, three positions, they need to build a clique. So in my example, v3, v2, v0, they form a clique perfect. So the second condition is that every vertex now outside of, the, of this initial clique. So by the way, I will keep referring to these first three that are building a clique. I will continually refer to it as the initial click. So then going back to my second condition, every vertex that is outside of our initial click should have at least k adjacent predecessor. So that's the second condition. So that is every such vertex outside of the first k plus one positions must have at least k neighbors in the input graph that come before it in our vertex order. So in this quick example, the last vertex here, V1, it actually needs at least two, k equal to two, it needs at least two predecessors, but in the graph actually as indicated by the blue edges there, there are three of them, so we are more than fine. And such a solution, such a vertex order, it is called a DVOP distance vertex order uh, for our instance. And in this case, this example constitutes a one such order. So why do we care about DVOP actually? So Basically, what we can say is that if such an order exists, it would help us solving the actual BGP problem efficiently because it will tell us how to position the vertices relative to each other by following this very order. All right, so now let's define some optimal versions of DVOP orders. So let's take the six vertex example, the six vertex input graph example, for which again, we are looking for a realization in k equal to two, so in, in two dimensional Euclidean space. So in this example here, I do have a candidate DVOP order, as you can quickly check from the graph, the first k plus one, these first three guys, they indeed form a uh, click in the input graph and everybody else has at least k adjacent predecessors. So following this order, we can solve now the DGP, origin of DGP problem via, as Douglas already explained very well, so if my job is easy, via this so-called branch and prune algorithm, which will create some sort of a search tree to find the positions of our six vertices, right? So in that case, what we can do is after, if I'm not following the order, so if we can first determine some coordinates for our first three vertices, namely V3, V5, and V2, then relative to those positions, those ones that are, that are whose positions are fixed, for the next vertex, in my example, V1, then we will have at most two coordinate options as we are solving this quadratic distance equation, right? So this means that if I actually look at my search tree here, it means that this tree will branch at V2 vertex, denoting that the next vertex in the order, namely V1, would have at most two options. So why I keep saying at most two, because like if we do have a bunch of other edges in our input graph, then they might even have fewer than that, for instance, one option, and this is in fact what's happening for the remaining set of vertices here. So one way or another, we will end up for this DVOP order, if we follow it, we will end up with a such branch and prune tree search tree that will help us to solve the original DGP problem. So now let's take a different DVOP order. So in that case, if we again do the same, uh, same, same procedure, then we will end up with a larger, much larger actually in this example, search tree. So basically these vertices that you see in colored here, these are the ones where we created two branches and these vertices are called the double vertices. So hence the name of the problem, min double. So the goal is to find the DVOP order minimizing the number of double vertices, again, with this motivation that we will hopefully end up with a much smaller search tree so to solve the original DGP problem. And this is called the min double problem introduced by Jeremy and Douglas in 2017. All right, so what is the main observation? To repeat one more time, the main observation is that in the search tree, branching on a vertex with exactly k adjacent predecessors in the order, it would yield at most to child nodes. And in that regard, we are calling a vertex V a double vertex if it has exactly K adjacent predecessors in the order. And if it is, if it is, it has more than K, it's, let's say K plus one, then we call it a non-double indicated by this double function. So what is the mean double problem one more time? It is basically the problem that is aiming to find the DVOP order that minimizes the number of doubles in the in solution, again, with this motivation of minimizing the size of the search branch and boundary. 
They also actually, Jeremy and Douglas, they also defined a closely related optimization problem called min nodes. So this one is trying to find a DVOP order that minimizes the maximum number of nodes in the search tree. Why I keep saying maximum here is because like, if you do have these additional edges, in that case, you might actually get rid of more. So you might end up less with less number of nodes. And by the way, I do apologize. I need to turn this. Yeah, because if you do have extra edges, then you might end up fewer number of nodes, but that is the second problem. So in this talk, I will focus on the min double problem, but all the formulations and everything algorithms we propose, they could be easily with a simple change of uh, objective function with some with the help of some auxiliary set of variables could be also applied to the min double problem. All right, so here's the general form of our min double formulation. So what we are looking for, again, a vertex order that will be described by this rank function. What does it do? It basically takes a vertex and it will return you a position, a rank that is from this integer set zero up to n minus one. So I will be using in the whole set of slides this bracket notation to denote the integer interval. And again, I am, I'm starting my indices from zero rather than one. So this rank function will take a vertex and it will tell us which position this vertex goes in the order. And we also have this double function, which for a given vertex, it will tell us whether it is a double vertex or not. Right? So in the general form of the formulation, what we are trying to do is we are looking for each position in the order, a rank R. So again, for looking from zero to n minus one, if for such a given rank, we find which vertex, because we are taking the inverse of the rank function, which vertex goes into that rank, and then we see whether it's a double or not. If it is double, we add one to our objective. Otherwise, it doesn't count, right? And then this rank function should basically constitute a DVOP order with a bunch of constraints. Hopefully, we will ensure that in different formulations. And the last set of constraints here, they are ensuring that every vertex that whose rank is already in the order greater than or equal to k, so ensuring that basically every vertex outside of the first this initial click that I mentioned, right, with rank greater than or equal to k, then that guy should have at least k adjacent predecessors. Moreover, if it has exactly k adjacent predecessor in the order, then it should be a double. So basically, for a given vertex v, if you look at the left-hand side expression here is you are looking for the neighbors of the v in the input graph. So then you look at whether your neighbor comes before you it is rank is smaller than yours. And if so, you indicate it by this indicator function. So basically, this is counting the left hand side as number of adjacent predecessors of our vertex V. So basically, if this guy is actually equal to K, exactly K, then I need to turn this on. I need to make my double function really one because it can be at most one. It could be either zero or one, which indicates that if you have exactly K adjacent predecessors, you have to be a double. Otherwise, if you have, for instance, if you have zero, then you need to have, if you're a non-double, you need to have at least K plus one adjacent predecessors. So that's the general uh, problem formulation, but I will detail it with different options here soon. So let's look at the literature quickly. So Jeremy and Douglas in their paper where they introduced these two problems, optimal DVOP problems, they propose some integer programming formulations where they mostly relied on these binary variables indicating the precedence relationship between the vertices, which ones are double or not, as well as which ones go into the initial click or not. They, in one of the formulations, they also use some integer decision variables indicating the ranks of the vertices. So more specifically, they propose two integer programming IP formulations, which mainly differ how they break the cycles in this linear order, in the precedence, basically. So they have the cycles formulation, which only relies on the binary decision variables that I mentioned. And they also have the rank formulation, which also uses the integer variables, where they also replace this cycle breaking constraints with kind of a form of an MTZ miller tucker resembling formulation of traveling salesman problem. So they did something slightly different there. So in addition to these two formulations, they also propose a cutting plane algorithm that iteratively breaks the cycles within a branch and cut procedure. All right, so now let's see basically what we have to offer for this, these type of problems. So what we propose is, first of all, a new integer programming formulation, and then we propose three different constraint programming CP formulations, as well as 
two decomposition algorithms using both of these methodologies, if you will, hybrid IP and CP formulations. So I will skip the integer programming formulation because it's a direct extension of Lower's uh, integer programming formulation to this min double case. So it is pretty straightforward. So I will represent actually our constraint programming formulations because I think it's a very, very, I mean, first of all, it is the first use of, to the best of my knowledge, constraint programming in this area. Second of all, in case you haven't been familiar with the constraint programming, I just wanna point out that it could be actually particularly useful modeling tool thanks to it is this search and logical inference type of strength, its, its properties. So in constraint programming, you can have these like crazy forms of constraints. They could be nonlinear, they could be discontinuous. You have especially these so-called global constraints that can represent these combinatorial structures very, very compactly, and it will provide very useful information in reducing your search space. So it could be a very good uh, modeling tool. And it has been actually shown to be very effective for these permutation-based type of problems. So we thought maybe it will also help us in this, again, ordering, vertex ordering problem. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free to interrupt me. If not, I will continue uh, with our constraint programming formulations. So in this first formulation that we are going to call CP rank formulation, why we are calling it rank formulation? Because we are introducing these rank variables. So R of V for a given vertex V will denote which position in the order, which rank this vertex V is assigned to. So it should be one of these integers, 0, 1, up to n minus 1. So in addition to those, we are defining these binary variables to indicate whether a vertex is a double one or not. So then here's the first portion of our constraints. First things first, the, of course, the binary and integer restrictions on our decision variables. So now let's look at the objective. In the objective, obviously, we are trying to minimize the number of doubles that we have in the solution. So we are just summing over for all the vertices, whether they are double or not. But there is one thing that we can handle a little bit more uh, cleverly here. We are adding this number one because in an order, for instance, if my k is equal to two, then what I know is that the third guy has always exactly two adjacent predecessors. So the guy at position K, actually in my case, it's gonna be K because I'm starting my positions from indices from zero. So the guy at position K, it is known to be always a double vertex. So that's why, because this guy is always a double, we are adding a number one from the beginning, from the get-go for this guy. All right, so but one way or another, we are minimizing the number of doubles in our, in our solution, in our order. So the first set of constraints are basically, these are these nicely known global constraints in constraint programming known as all different. So what they are doing is they are basically operating over these n by uh, integer decision variables, r rank variables. But since these guys also have a range of size n, so basically what these constraints are doing is it is assigning a one-to-one -one mapping between these ranked decision variables and their domain zero to n minus one integer interval. So basically what it is forcing is it is forcing every rank R variable in our set to have a unique value. And uh, because again, it's acting on n variables uh, whose domain also has n distinct values. So it is constituting basically an order for a linear order for us. The next set of constraints here are ensuring that we have an initial click of size k plus one in our vertex order by having these only pairs of vertices that are adjacent in the input graph uh, to be allocated. So more specifically here, if you look at the constraints, so if you give me two vertices u and v from the input graph for which there doesn't exist an edge between the two. So if these are not adjacent in the original graph, then they cannot belong to the first k plus one positions, k positions, because they cannot be a part of the click because they are missing the edge between themselves. So that's why one of them, either the rank of u or rank of rank of v, should be outside of the first k click. So k plus one click. So they should go to position different than zero up to k. They should be at least positioned at k plus one. So the, thanks to these constraints, we are building in the R solution an initial click. And how we implement these, sorry, how we implement these type of constraints in constraint programming is we are using some sort of a cardinality uh, uh, close constraint. So actually this is this, this one that I want to mention. So the last set of constraints here, what we are trying to do is all vertices 
with ranks outside of the initial clique, they should have at least k adjacent predecessors by the definition of, of the problem if they are double, and otherwise if they are non-double, they should have at least k plus one. And these guys are trying to do that. So if you give me any vertex from the input graph, and if this guy is outside of my initial clique, then what I look at here is I look at it as neighbors, and with this indicator function here, I am counting again how many adjacent predecessors this guy has. That's what this yellow expression is doing. And if this is exactly k, then you need to turn on your binary variable one to satisfy this one so that you will become a double. On the other hand, if you are not a double, then you need to have at least k plus one on the left hand side. So these are also necessary. So with all these, we have a complete valid formulation for the min double problem. All right, so next we have the CP vertex formulation, which can be seen actually the dual of the first rank formulation. So in this one, what we are trying to use as the decision variables are the double decisions still binary the same, whether the, but the only thing now this different is this R is in the index here. So I give you a position in the order, and then this YR means whether you put a vertex into that position that is going to be a double. The other set of variables that we are using, integer variables, are these v of r. If I, whichever vertex goes into that position r in the order, it is denoting it as index. So whether it is going to be vertex 0 or it's going to be the last vertex indexed by v minus 1. So we change the definition of the variables. So starting off with, again, the integer and binary variable domains. The objective function, again, it's pretty simple. It is just trying to minimize the total number of doubles that we would like to have. Again, as before, we do have these global all different constraints, which is going to give us this one-to-one -one mapping between our vertices and the ranks. OK, so this next set of constraints, because we changed the definitions of the variables, it looks a little bit different. This set of constraints, remember, they were trying to enforce that you have the initial click of size k. So how we can do that in this case, how we can have an initial click of size k plus 1, now we are enforcing all vertices in the first k plus one ranks to be all adjacent to each other. So for instance, here I am first choosing these two indices i and j corresponding to two ranks in the order. And more specifically, I am choosing these ranks zero up to k. I am choosing indices, let's say i and j here. And then if you look at the variables here, the i denotes which vertex goes into that position i and vj is which vertex goes into that rank j. And in the adjacency graph A of your input graph, this you should see a one, meaning that these vertices going into these positions I and J, they would be actually adjacent. All right. And in constraint programming, you can implement these constraints via these so-called element global constraints, which again have quite strong inference uh, properties. So next up, we are enforcing all vertices after the initial click. Now we would like to enforce all vertices that have a rank greater than k outside of our initial click to have at least, again, k adjacent predecessors if they are double, or at least k plus 1 adjacent predecessors if they are not doubles. So this time, sorry, you cannot see my for alls, but for all r that is already greater than equal to k plus 1, so I am looking at a rank that is outside of my initial k plus 1, click, then on the left-hand side here, what I'm looking is for all the positions that are coming before R, whoever goes into R and now whoever goes into J. So R is a position like this, J is a position that comes before that. And I'm basically counting here by looking at the adjacency matrix, whether these vertices going into these positions, J and R, they are adjacent or not. And if so, for a fixed R, this left-hand side expression then giving me how many adjacent predecessors my vertex located at position r would have and as before if it is a non-double then it is at least k plus one otherwise if it has it has exactly k then it has to be identified as a double vertex so finally here what we can do is we can fix the decision variables whose double values are already known so if you look at my example for instance if k is equal to two then i know that the guy at this position k, it is always going to be a double. So you can go ahead and fix this guy. And for the ones in the initial click, they never have k. Uh, they, they have it, k, k minus 1 adjacent uh, vertices. So in that case, they can never be a double. So we can also fix those guys uh, that are in the positions of the initial click. 
All right, so this is our second constraint programming formulation, namely CPE vertex formulation. So the third one, it is pretty easy to explain. So basically what we are doing in the third one is we are putting both of these CP formulations together. So basically we are combining these primal and dual models so that we can have some stronger inferences in the search algorithm. To make it even stronger, we are adding these so-called inverse constraints for our vertex variables and the rank variables. And what, the, what do these guys do is they basically channel our primal and dual rank and vertex variables. So what does it mean is it is basically stating the obvious, but it's really helpful in the inferences to link those variables explicitly. So what it is saying is that if basically you have a vertex, uh, if you have a vertex i and it goes into rank r of i that is equal to j, then which vertex goes into that rank J, it is the vertex I. So it is just stating the obvious, but thanks to these, we are explicitly in a more tight manner, we are linking our rank and vertex variables. All right, so now we have some formulations, they work well and everything, but in order to be able to hopefully handle some larger instances, we also develop some decomposition algorithms. So here's our first decomposition algorithm. This is actually the first thing that will come into your mind. Basically, that's why we are calling it the naive decomposition. So in this one, we are decomposition, decomposing our original problem into two pieces, a master problem, who's going to be an integer program, and a sub problem which we, for which we will use a constraint program. So what are the tasks of these guys? So master problem will choose which vertices are going to be identified as doubles. And given that candidate double solution, the sub problem will try to build a DVOP order respecting that provided double sequence. And if it, find, it finds one, then we are done, obviously. Otherwise, if the sub problem happens to be infeasible, we need to return some information back to our master problem saying that you cannot give me a double solution like this because I'm going to end up failing to uh, build an order for you respecting this double sequence. So give me a different candidate, right? So these inequalities called cuts, they will give the incentive to master problem to provide a different candidate in this iterative algorithm. And we will repeat it until we find no more violated cuts so that we will stop. So if the sub problem is infeasible, we will be using this special type of cuts called combinatorial Banders cuts, which we are deriving actually a little bit more cleverly. So we are not using the most obvious form of the cuts, but we are basically using this after we solve the sub problem, it happens to be infeasible. We are solving another or applying another algorithm, heuristic algorithm to try to trying to find an infeasible, irreducible subsystem of our constraint. So our sub problem has a bunch of constraints and altogether they're infeasible. But with this IAS search, what you are trying to do is you are trying to find the minimal set of constraints. Let's say these three guys saying that as long as these three pink constraints are part of your formulation, forget about the rest, you are infeasible. So we are trying to find such minimal infeasible source of information and return stronger cutting planes to our master problem. All right, so here's the formulations. How do they look like for this naive decomposition? As I said, master problem is trying to choose the doubles and the vertex order is decided then for a given double sequence by our uh, sub problem, which is a constraint program. So master problem is basically just working with these double variables. So it is pretty straightforward. But then what happens is given a Y candidate solution Y hat here, sub problem has to have some constraints. So sub problem, it is trying to, thanks to these first two and the domain constraint is trying to build a vertex order, a DVOP order. But given that for a position R outside of our first click ranks, if master problem identified you that, oh, you are a double, then how many adjacent predecessors you should have, it is at least K. And actually, because of the minimization, it will be equal to K. But if you are identified as a non-double by the master problem, then K is not enough. You need to have at least K plus one adjacent predecessors. So basically, we are trying to respect what master decided early on in the subproblem. Right? So where this IIS information, minimal system of uncertainty information will come from, it will come from, from these constraints linking our master and subproblem decisions. So basically, if we solve the subproblem, let's say, and it happens to be infeasible, we are going to ask an algorithm to give us between, among these first, sorry, among these constraints for 
all these R's, which ones actually are necessary to lead to infeasibility. So basically, not necessary, but sufficient to end up with infeasibility. We will look for a smaller subset of these type of constraints. And once we have that, then we can introduce this type of a combinatorial banders curve. So again, my master problem gave me the candidate solution, double solution y hat. I saw my sub problem, it is infeasible. I ran my algorithm to find an IAS. Among these are constraints, run constraints, which ones are leading up to infeasibility all along. So in that case, the cut will do the following. The cut will say that you are summing over the ranks for which master in, in the y hat solution decided to be a double or non-double, but not all of them we are summing over. We are only summing over the ones that appear in our IAS system. So in that regard, basically what this is trying to say, let's say I might have, let's say this is my candidate y solution, y hat solution from the master problem. And in that regard, we are looking at the ranks that are outside of this one. And let's say if the IAS gave you the indices like this guy and this guy, then the cut is saying that you should take one minus zero, one, two, three, five, y five plus y six. So this guy is here, this guy is allocated here, should be greater than equal to one. So basically it is saying that as long as you keep these y five as one, y six as zero, you are gonna remain infeasible, change at least one of them. But the most obvious version of the cut would have been you consider all of the y variables corresponding to all the ranks and ask the master problem to change something in this whole solution. But we are just saying something stronger between y5 and y6, just change one of them. Otherwise, you will remain infeasible. And we also propose in this work some value inequalities to further strengthen our problem formulation. But despite all those improvements, when we run this algorithm, this naive decomposition algorithm, what happens is we observe that it is actually converging. It's a good thing that it converges in very few iterations, but overall it is it could be very slow. And why it could be slow is because there is some sort of a bad decomposition that we started with. So our master problem, it is super weak because it's just trying to make this blind guess of who should be double. And then sub problem is, has the whole difficult task of building the order. Right, so there's a huge imbalance here. So can we end up with a more balanced formulation? So in that regard, here's our second for decomposition called witness-based decomposition. So as I said, ideally our decomposition would be more should be more balanced. The master problem should make not only the double decisions, but also it should decide some aspects of the vertex ordering, not the whole order, of course, but partial decisions it should make regarding the order itself. However, in our current set of formulations, what we are working with is we only have these limited two types of decisions, namely which ones are going to be doubles and for the vertices, which ones will be assigned to which ranks, right? So we only work with these two and our decomposition right now was like this, y's are in the master problem, the rest is in the uh, sub problem. So then in order to improve this, we need to, because we cannot decompose this further between these two sets of variables, we are decided, we decided to add more decision variables so that we can end up with the different types of decompositions. And this is where this witness idea came to light. So basically we are trying to add some new decisions that will restrict our search space for the vertex order, but in a less restrictive way than providing the full linear ordering. So we don't wanna describe the full order, but we would like to make at least some decisions that will restrict the order choices for the sub problem. So to do so, we are introducing this concept of a witness of a vertex. So what is it? If you give me a vertex V, the witness set, the witnesses of that vertex V, we are defining as this minimal set of adjacent predecessors of V in the order, such that if V itself is a double, it will have exactly K witnesses, and if it is a non-double, that's the key here, it will have exactly K plus one witnesses, right? And what is a witness again? It will basically give the justification that that vertex V deserves to go into that position in the order because it has enough witnesses guaranteeing you that, right? So let's go back to my example on the left here. So if you consider, for instance, this vertex V4, it has actually the arrows here are denoting the uh, denoting the neighbors of the V, V4, or all the vertices in that manner. So if you look at the original graph, V4 actually has these vertices, green ones, V1 and V0, that are both, it is neighbors in the input graph and they come before V4 in the, in the order. So in other words, it has these two 
adjacent predecessors. And this guy actually, it is identified as a double vertex. And in that regard, V1 and V0 will constitute as it is witnesses for V4 to be belonging to that position as well as becoming a double, right? So on the other hand now, let's, let's consider V5 vertex here. So basically, if you look at the graph, V5 has these four green neighbors in the graph. But if this guy, we are identifying this guy as a non-double. So in that case, although it has four vertices, by the way, my k is equal to two, what I'm trying to say is I just need three witnesses for this guy to be identified as a non-double. I don't need four. So in that case, although it has four neighbors, I will say I will take only these first three guys as the witness of V5 being non-double. Right. And in that regard, we are making a convention here. We are saying that if you have an adjacent predecessor that belongs to the initial clique, it will always be a witness of you so that we are breaking some ties. We have we are always choosing the ones in the initial clique as the witnesses first. And if need be, we are choosing the ones outside of the initial clique. So in that regard, since V5 has all the guys here in the initial K plus one clique as the neighbors, we are choosing them as it is witnesses. We are not taking V2 as a witness for V5. All right, so now with this witness definition, here's the main idea behind our witness-based decomposition. So master problem as before, it is trying to decide who's gonna be a double, but in addition to that, it is trying to decide on the who's gonna form the initial click and who's gonna be the witness of who. So we are adding these two sets of decision variables to a couple variables that I will show quickly is gonna be the initial click decisions and the Ws will correspond to witness decisions. The task of the sub problem, it is exactly the same given this candidate solution. It is respecting to that, but trying to build a DVOP order. If it is infeasible, again, we will compute an IIS and try to return some kinds. So I'm not gonna get into details of this one, but again, we have an integer programming based master problem here. We are trying to minimize the number of doubles and these kappa variables are trying to choose k plus one vertices to fall into the initial click. And if basically there are two guys that are not a part of the adjacency list, so they should they cannot both go, both go into the initial click, at most one of them you can choose. And these next two set of constraints are linking our initial click decisions to witness decisions because of our convention. And the next set of decisions are linking our witness decisions to again, the initial click, as well as more importantly, the double decisions. And then given this candidate, kappa hat and w hat solution to the sub problem, sub problem is trying to now build an order, right? Define, decide on the ranks of the vertices. But if for instance, master problem told you that we should be a, in the, we should belong to the initial click, then it is rank should be less than equal to K. Or if the master problem told you that none of these two vertices, U and V, they are in the initial click and V needs to use U as a witness, then U has to come before V in the order. So sub problem is taking these decisions into account. So in terms of the cuts very quickly, basically if our sub problem happens to be infeasible, we will generate again a combinatorial Banders cut, which will look something like this. But what they are corresponding to actually, they are indeed corresponding to cycle breaking cuts. So basically if our sub problem is, is, is infeasible, a reason for that could be the existence of a cycle in the witness W candidate solution. Because you can say that I have these, let's say, maybe not W, I have these vertices U, V, J, and U uses V as a witness V, or maybe the other way around, V uses U as a witness, J uses V as a witness, but master thought that U also uses J as a witness. This is gonna be a contradiction to our goal of building a linear order. So that's why if we identify a cycle in our witness solution, we should break it with the with these type of constraints. And again, I will, I will skip the details for that. I just wanna mention that they are indeed corresponding to cycle breaking constraints. So we also show that uh, basically these type of cycle breaking constraints, these combinatorial Banders cuts, they're actually all the cuts that we need. We don't need to look for other families of uh, cutting planes to make sure that our iterative decomposition algorithm it is gonna converge to a true optimal solution. So in that regard, what we are showing is that if you had the original problem and extended formulation of the full problem where you combine all the decisions, then if you look at it as projection into the master variable space, then it is the, our current master problem plus these cycle breaking constraints, which means that we don't need anything else. 
And one last thing that is actually cool about this is we don't need to solve the sub problem as a constraint program here because there are corresponding cycle breaking constraints. We can just run a cycle detection algorithm which can be handled much more efficiently. So for the next couple of minutes, I just would like to show you some computational results where we are gonna use a thousand second time limit. And I will only present the results with k equal to two, sorry, three, because we also run with four and five, but the conclusions were the same. So I will skip those. I will only provide results with k equal to three. And in terms of our test instances, we are considering three classes where we have some randomly generated graphs of different vertex levels and, and different graph densities. We do have these synthetic instances, which we created to simulate the sparsest possible graph instances that will still have a DVOP order. And finally, the commonly used like protein-based instances. In that regard, thanks to Jeremy, we are using these pseudo-protein instances obtained by modifying the actual protein data bank instances. All right, so here are the results. So in the results, I will be using performance profiles, which are showing that on the x-axis here, you have the time in seconds, and on the y-axis here, you have number of instances solved by that time. So since this is a performance profile, if you have an algorithm whose profile looks closer to this top left corner, it means it's a better, better algorithm, right? So in this case, what we are comparing is from the literature, we are comparing with the most successful one among the ones that we tried, namely this cutting plane algorithm CCG by Jeremy and Douglas. And then we have our IP formulation. We have our bunch of constraint programming formulations, some of them strengthened with the valid inequalities. And here, witness was not working well. So I'm only talking about naive decomposition strengthened with our valid inequalities. So if you look at the performance profile here, many of them are actually performing similarly, but maybe these this guy, which is our combined CP formulation, and the red one here, which is our CP vertex formulation, as well as the yellow one, which is our naive decomposition, these are looking a little bit better than the others. So naive decomposition in particular, it scales up a little bit better if you, if you go further. But these guys, CP formulations and naive decomposition is working well for the random instances. So the next one, these sparsest synthetic instances, what's happening is now witness-based decomposition came into play that we show in black line here. It certainly outperforms the other formulations, both in terms of speed, as well as how many instances it can solve by our time limit. And finally, the pseudoprotein instances, the situation looks quite similar to synthetic instances, the best performing method being the witness-based decomposition, but the other cycle-based algorithm, the CCG, is also catching up. So for maybe application purposes, again, it is showing that the cycle type of combinatorial structure it is good to keep in mind. All right, so to conclude very quickly, basically for this min double problem, we propose three CP formulations, one IP formulation that I didn't have time to talk about, and two hybrid decomposition methods. We also propose the first valid inequalities for this problem. And in terms of the results, our CP and decomposition algorithms were working pretty well, I would say, but there's still room for improvement. So we still cannot scale up as much as we want. So there is definitely room for further research. If you're interested in reading more about this work, you can find it online. It's already published. All right, thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you very much. So are there, may, are there questions from the audience? Let me check, there is nothing in the chat. I have one, Antonio. Yeah, please do that. Yeah. I move. So uh, thank you for the very nice talk and for this, this new paradigm for, in, for encountering the, the vertex orders for the DMGGP. It's really nice to know that there are more people working on these problems. And my question is, um, the main difficulty in these vertex orders is the fact that the adjacent predecessors must be contiguous, right? No, in this case, no. In DMDGP, yes, you need to have this click thing. Yeah. About... Uh -huh. So uh, in DVOP, like... no. Yeah, OK, I agree, agree. But uh, if you include the consecutivity assumption of the predecessors, mm -hmm. uh, have you already performed some experiments to, to see you mean, what for happens? Instance, for extensions of these models to DMDGP, for instance? Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have another paper with 
Moira actually it's also published. You can also find it online where we specifically mm-hmm. studied the DMDGP problem and again proposed uh, constraint programming models. So the good thing is mm-hmm. here constraint programming can handle these click structures as well with some special type of constraints. So again, we've seen that these different type of global structures, what constraint programming can offer, can also help with those contiguity type of restrictions. Yeah, it, it's okay, nice. helpful there too. Okay, I'll look for the reference later. And the second question is, have you compared them? Uh, because, you know, I guess uh, Antonio and the other co-authors, they have the so-called uh, grid algorithm to find the uh, DevOps orders, okay? Yeah, so um, I forgot to mention, we actually run it and we provide it as a warm start to ah, okay, all the yeah. algorithms. Indeed. All right, all right. I mean, it's and a great one my... to start with, so we definitely benefit <laughs> all right. from that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So... Uh, Maybe it's a silly question. Um, um, if you run the, the grid algorithm from every possible initial click, uh, yeah, yeah. how long it takes in comparison with, uh, with your constraint programming formulations? I mean, I know that, uh, okay, as the number of uh, vertices, the number of the clicks in the graph increases, this is uh, terrible, but I'd like yeah. to, to hear about that. I don't know whether I, have the numbers with me i can check but i would guess still that yeah it because like even solving one i mean if you look at some of the instances let's say protein we are still talking about like up to thousand seconds to solve one model right so we yeah. are not of mm-hmm. course here fixing the initial click but i would guess that it will still not be a viable approach and in fact i want to point out that of course you know much better than i do but the key difference here between our cycle-based formulation, if you will, and your cycle-based formulation mm-hmm. is in yours, like you're actually enumerating these initial clicks and we don't. Yeah. We are just making them as decision variables and hopefully we don't need to mm-hmm. worry about all this crazy number of clicks, for instance. So it's been helpful. So with the same reasoning, I would guess that it will not be an affordable or at least viable approach compared to the others here, I would say. But it's a good question. I think it would be a good thing. Still have the numbers. We might have tried it already because we have enumerated all the clicks for certain instances, but it was even large for medium-sized instances, of course. Okay, Mervy, thank you very much. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. Other questions for our speaker? We have time, we have 10 minutes, so maybe we can devote the five minutes to other questions if there are. And can you, uh, can you relate anything to, uh, to rigidity of the graph? If the algorithm works, does it imply any type of rigidity? In the, what do we mean by the degenerate of the graph? Rigidity. Um, oh, rigidity. Uh, hmm. Yeah, we were really, really interested in some other properties of the graphs, how they translate into these problems and the performance of the algorithms. And in that regard, actually, we used some combinatorial structures in the graphs themselves in driving our valid inequalities, which were helpful certainly. But in terms of the specific concept of rigidity, to be honest, we haven't analyzed. That could very well be linked. I think there's certainly a strong relationship between the graph structure and what we can do in this domain in regarding, regarding to get these vertex orders. But we haven't looked at the rigidity concept. We looked at some other things, but not rigidity per se. Yeah, it seems that <clears throat> can you replace the clique property by some rigidity property in terms of the vertex ordering? I mean, in this DVOP version, we only talk about the initial clique, which is up to K, right? Or K plus one, if you will. So, and K is being a small number, let's say three to five in the first case. So that initial clique is not the issue here, I would say. In the DMDGP, certainly, because you would like to have this overlapping click structure. There, it could definitely make a big impact, I think. But for DVOP, I would guess that even if we have such findings, it could be less expected to be maybe less effective. I'm just guessing, but yeah, because we have literally a small click that we are talking about here. Yeah, Merv, related to every question. So in practice, uh, all the study that you presented today, it's, uh, you know, you have as a starting point, a distance geometry problem. So there are distances somewhere. So you have distances on arcs, yeah. of a graph, yeah. but you never consider the numerical value of the, of the distance. No, yeah, because okay. we are just looking for the order 
And again, the motivation is if you have that order, then you can discretize the source space of the DGP problem. And those actual values will come into play in the branch and prune algorithm where you are trying to find the exact coordinates uh, for the DGP problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, they really yeah. don't mean anything for finding the order, right? But yeah, if yeah. you consider you. maybe building the order, keeping in mind how they will be used in the branch and prune algorithm, could there be a way to also incorporate these distances? Maybe based on some distances, maybe you prefer certain orders than the others. I don't know. Could they be still considered jointly? Yeah, yeah, okay. Because actually, yeah, the, my first question was to introduce my second question. Have you considered, start to consider uh, to extend to uh, distance geometry problems with the interval distances? Because, uh, okay, so far, if you suppose that you have exact distances, every distance has the same value. But uh, if you have interval distances, you, have an, you can have an interval with a large range, interval with small range. And so what to, at this point, what we prefer to put up in the tree, the intervals exactly. with larger or smaller, you know, we can make this sort of consideration. I don't know yeah, if- Yeah, it will make it. these optimal order problems a little bit more meaningful and interesting, I suppose, and more impactful potentially. Yeah, so, I was following the literature, many of your papers came about for the interval version of these problems that I'm really interested in. But yeah, Moira graduated and she started PhD and she moved from distance geometry to discrete geometry. So, mm -hmm. and, but it's on my list to still continue doing some work in this domain and interval one is definitely on my list when the time comes, but I didn't have the time to look into them yet. But certainly I think there is still a lot to do in this domain and you guys have been all doing amazing work and it won't stop anytime soon. Yeah, and I hope I can so. continue 